All right, let's start. Let me use my little time timer. Have you guys seen these things? It's awesome. A little, a little digital timer. Oh, it's just like, yeah. Welcome. Well, thanks for coming, hey, everyone. Uh, I'm going to share some of the lessons learned from uh, my experience with the Mythos Initiative during Google Summer of Code programs. So it's an internship program run out of Google. It's only a summer long, but the experience is endless. We'll get into that. It's 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 a pretty amazing program. Um, and what particularly what um, uh, the Mifos Foundation has done when we started and after I left Grameen Foundation uh, uh, has it, it's really driven a, quite a bit of growth for uh, the project. You know, when you utilize something so effectively, it can be a real great growth driver. So here's some of the things to talk about. I don't read my slide much, so. Tell me, can, can everybody see? Does anybody have visual impairment that needs help? Okay, then I'm not going to read much, so it's up to you. Quick agenda, and hopefully it'll be valuable for you, whether you're a potential intern. Anybody a potential intern? Yeah, you guys, come on, raise your hands. Yes, raise your hands. You one in the back, two in the front. I'm counting you anyway. That's three. That's three in the <laughs> We want to teach you how you can unlock an endless summer of code. For organizations with any type of internship program, not just GSOC, you learn how your organization can be successful during the program uh, and ensure results and contributions long to the future. Uh, really, I mean, that's what most internships are about is, is ongoing involvement and contribution. And I'm right under a air conditioning vent. Is every <laughs> It's cold, but I'm good. I'll, be, I'll get a jacket. Nice coat. Thank you. Uh, for students, interns, uh, how you can get the most out of your internship or even just participation in an open source project, um, you'll grow professionally, you get an impact on the problem. Does everybody know what an internship is? Anybody not? It's not a dumb question. It's a great question. Okay, I'm going to define it anyway because I know somebody is afraid to ask. So it's a short-term job, usually a rotation, uh, probably not uh, full-time pay or benefits. It's, it's a limited position for a limited problem. It's a great way to rotate into a company and see what they do and get involved and work on one project. Anybody former, has anybody done GSOC? I have. As a mentor? Or? Either, either. Oh, you have two? For which project? Uh, we had some people working on Anaconda. Anaconda, cool. Uh, Outreachy, anyone? You mentioned it, yeah. I haven't done it, but okay. Anybody got an org that's planning on doing a GSOC or Outreachy? What org? Uh, Cody. Co Cody? Okay. Yeah, cool. We've done it for like 10 years or like 12 years or something. Okay. And Fedora will do one too? Yeah, Fedora and Red Hat are involved. Okay. Across various projects. I'm All right. Sure Wayne. Which specific ones. Wayne, Jesse, there's, there's hope. There's hope, yeah. Wyatt, Jesse, are you guys listening? Okay. <laughs> okay, repeat everything I've said so far. Okay, uh, let's give you a little, this, this is about me real quick. I'll try not to bore you to death, but uh, I've been a software engineering leader for about 20 years. Um, I like listening, talking, teaching, uh, floss, and kindness. From 2007 to 2011, I was a software engineer at the Grameen Foundation focusing on MIFOS. Uh, yeah, so that's me and the rock guy. That's the Seagull crew. These are the folks who started the Seagull. Does everybody know about Seagull? Anybody not know about Seagull? Okay, it's in Seattle, it's a lot like this. If you like this, you'd love Seagull. Uh, there's my team at work, and there's my family. These are like, all the top. These are rad people, all these people. Okay, so here's Mifos in a nutshell. It's an award-winning nonprofit FLOSS software project, free Libre open source software. Uh, Apache license, is part of the Apache uh, Software Foundation now. Is dedicated to ending poverty one line of code at a time. I came up with that slogan, 2007. Uh, Gen, Gen 1 was the project of the Grameen Foundation's Tech Center. It most likely is the MIFOS uh, you may have heard of. Anybody heard of MIFOS? Nobody. Okay, that's great. So, microfinance open source. Uh, it's uh, software that banks would use to lend to poor people. So, developing countries, uh, kind of the first step of of security is financial security. It's They call it Grameen style joint liability lending and so here's a, a lending group uh, uh, out of Africa and the idea is kind of in a nutshell peer pressure. So you're lending together, um, you have more lending power with a group and that's kind of the Grameen model. 
Yeah, two billion unbanked. I mean, there's a lot of billion numbers problems, uh, access to healthcare, uh, but banking is even one of them. And you know, you got to pay for that healthcare somehow. So, so we can all get bank accounts, right? Everybody in this room, you got no problem. Uh, I don't know what the age, the lower age limit is, but even my kids are six and ten. They have bank accounts. Two point five billion people cannot. It's a huge problem. This is a crisis, banking crisis. Uh, it, it can you just stop life in your tracks. And without that security, you can't plan, for example. I mean, education, all sorts of things. Uh, anybody heard of Muhammad Yunus? Okay, Nobel Prize winner, 2006, uh, for, for this kind of Grameen lending model. He's worked with the Grameen Bank. Uh, he got the Nobel Prize. Akiva, anybody heard of Akiva? Okay, same type of deal. Um, they are another way that the... Uh, Grameen style micro lending is implemented. I mean, the, I, don't, I don't know as much about Kiva. Some people from Grameen ended up going over to Kiva, uh, but the idea is that that uh, micro loans. Kiva very successful. Check it out. Uh, try a loan. Twenty five bucks, I think, is the minimum. Mm -hmm. Financial inclusion goes beyond just providing access to credit for poor women. And you'll you'll hear women bless you. You hear women brought up a lot of times with lending, and it's always women, women, women. That's because when you lend to women, they send their kids to school. When you lend to men, not as great a result. Just, per, just period, on and on again. So, so that's why, if you're ever wondering why you keep your it's microcredit and women together, it's because uh, it's more successful when it's when the loans go to women. But it's really about access to a full range of financial services, like a secure place to save, low cost payments, ability to manage risk through insurance. They uplift the lives of their family with the security planning, all of that. I mean, it starts with a bank account, something we take very much for granted like clean water. Technology makes the delivery of financial services more efficient, but now is the driving force behind financial inclusion 2.0. So, and I'm sorry, I don't know if this is a term Ed coined or if this is, um, this is a, a movement, but uh, financial inclusion is kind of the broader concept of everybody should have banking. It's a basic human right. Uh, mobile's a huge player. You might have heard most of the world has mobile phones now. Uh, they can transact money by sending around the mobile minutes, which can often be more secure than the local currency. So as the industry has evolved from microfinance to financial inclusion to digital financial services, Mifos in various forms has presided over the launch of three generations of technology to guide the sector. Uh, first was this Grameen Foundation project in 2006. That's the one I worked on. And then it spun out in 2011, uh, the independent MIFOS initiative. They, they launched MIFOS X. It's now called Apache Finneract. And it was the world's first open source API-driven platform for financial inclusion. Do all those words make sense? Or am I thrown out? OK. So the idea with MIFOS was you think of it more like, OK, it's a client server, pretty thick and heavy uh, bank management application. Uh, Mifos X, uh, much more lightweight, uh, written with only APIs in mind, and it's something you plug your financial system into for inclusion of whatever kind of financial inclusion you're implementing. So the new stuff is Apache Finerac CN, cloud native, microservices, okay, the next generation. And uh, there's, there's a lot of different things involved in the Apache Finerac CN. Okay, so here's a quick look at the stack itself. Uh, we got a platform, there's a web app for running the back office and a suite of client facing mobile and web apps. And there's a rapid, rapid uh, there's an application framework for rapid development of digital financial services applications. So again, it's kind of the, the fundamentals, the, the building blocks uh, that the rather large financial innovators can, can use to make their financial inclusion packages. So any of these open source applications could be used out of the box as a production ready solution, but they're on the foundation for others to innovate. Uh, the Apache Finerac platform is soon to be released application framework, providing an extensible backend that is fully exposed via APIs. The solution is not only an open source core banking platform, but it's more than that. It's a DNA of financial services that can be put together in many different ways. So the web app's got the UI. Uh, workflows and business processes for a core banking system for brick and mortar financial institution. The mobile side is for field operations, an app for direct outreach in the field. Uh, a lot of these, uh, these loan officers will ride out on a motorcycle directly to the lending group. 
because they can't get uh, they can't go the other way. And then there's also a suite of consumer-facing mobile and web apps so you can provide an omni-channel experience going direct to consumer, including mobile and online banking apps and mobile wallets. So omni-channel, we'll get back to that as well. So across the world, through our network of more than 120 partners, we reach more than 8.1 million clients served by 300 plus financial institutions across 48 countries. Most of these are traditional financial institutions. So where the primary use, of, use case of MIFOS has been to serve as a back office system for microfinance institutions, more and more digital financial service uh, and fintech companies have been the building innovative digital financial service solutions. So uh, I'll highlight a couple of these. Uh, Crazy B is interesting, an e-commerce lender using MIFOS X, uh, and they closed $8 million in a funding round. Um, there's uh, Moon Money Online is another interesting one. So all across the world, we've seen other partners provide robust core banking systems powered by MIFOS X, like Musoni, Finflux has done the same for India, IDT Labs for West Africa, and recently we even have a, have a bank in Germany migrate its entire loan portfolio onto MIFOS X. So this, this is generic lending software, and so uh, back when I was working on this, we had, I remember one company in Texas wanted to use it for their mattress loans, and it's fine, and they would interact and contribute back, and so you know, wherever you can plug it in. So guiding all this innovation is our global community. And, and this inspiration. So the inspiration and source of our shared vision is 3 billion Marie's. We aim to create a world 3 billion Marie's, a world where each person has access to the financial resources needed to create a better life for themselves and their family. 3 billion Marie's is a shared vision that unites our MIFOS community and what we work towards each day. Empowered by a tiny loan, Marie Claire Arwanda of Rwanda survived HIV and the death of two husbands to build a house for herself and her four children and started a second business in her village to employ others. Marie's triumphant escape from poverty is what motivates us each day. To keep the MFIs, microfinance institutions, and borrowers they serve at the front of our minds, we code name releases after Marie for each MFI user. So this was someone actually uh, the uh, the then leader of the MIFOS initiative, George Kennard, uh, uh, he met Marie and uh, got her story, and uh, she, was a, she was a lender that was a true success story out of Rwanda. In short, our global community is fighting poverty with financial inclusion. So this is really about GSOC, uh, but you can totally apply these concepts and concepts to any internship or university outreach program. 14th year for GSOC. Uh, so Google selects around 200 open source projects and mentoring organizations. These orgs supply both projects as well as the mentors to guide the interns. Google then provides a stipend to students chosen to work on the projects. Organizations post their list of ideas, students apply, organizations request slots, and then select students based on the slots they receive. Make sense? It's a pretty straightforward process. They walk you through it. Um, they're really good at it. So 2019 will be the eighth year for MIFOS. So here's kind of a picture of how many interns over the years. Uh, this is the sixth year we participated independently as MIFOS initiative. A again, originally it was under the Grameen Foundation. Uh, back in the old days, four interns. Uh, and when I was there, it was two. Uh, two is a handful. but this has been, Ed, Ed has scaled this program massively, as you can see here. Over the years, uh, we've been able to grow the level of participation, and most importantly, we've been able to have a strong retention rate of nearly two-thirds of our interns, keeping them as core members of the community and contributors to, con contributors to the projects years after. So I guess I'm one example of that as well. Uh, Twelve years after I was at the Grameen Foundation, I'm still volunteering, um, at giving this talk, for example. For 2019, we're now in the process of selecting students. 2018 tested the limits of our capacity and our mentors, and we were really challenged with such a large intern class to follow our recipe and blueprint to success, uh, but we're pushing through. Uh, this is me and Ed uh, 
uh, Linux Fest a couple times. We usually run into each other every time around. So I developed the original process and policies that we first put in place in 2009, and then Ed grew the MIFOS participation in GSOC uh, to the massive windfall of continuous talent, innovation, and participation that it is today. GSOC is incredibly impactful for us as a small org and a relatively niche product. It recently moved to having no paid developers. So MIFOS has quite a bit of development activity and no paid developers. I mean, it's, pre it's pretty significant when you think about it, the cost of development in general. GSOC has been the lifeblood and really the, the beating heart that's, that's powered this. Uh, for developing new innovation, even maintaining the core. They don't just, we don't just give uh, the intern side projects. They are in, so they got to be able to do everything. Uh, but it also it attracts new contributors. It grows the community <coughs> organically through problems like uh, the pro programs like the GCI, Google Code In, and uh, GSOC. It's only a summer long, but the impact is far-reaching and endless, not only for our community, but beyond our community and the lives that are touched. Um, they contribute very valuable code, and they're all driven by user need. Uh, the code is, is immediately and, and always relevant and useful. I mean, that's part of how you design the projects up front. You want to pick stuff that matters um, but isn't going to tank you. You know, you, you have to uh, uh, pick those very carefully. In the core platform, we've added support for two-factor auth, integrated with credit bureaus, and extended our data import tool. So all the projects are driven by user need again, and uh, some other uh, some other contributions here will be highlighted in the next few steps. These are some screenshots of mobile app changes. Um, here's kind of visualizing it more a uh, little mobile app workflow here. Uh, this, there's the field officer app, banking app, wallet app. Um, there's been a massive refactoring redesign integration with credit bureaus. Uh, many of our students also go on to have careers in open source. This is one of their first introductions to it often. Here's some of the companies the past students are working at now. Heard of these? <laughs> Hope so. Uh, this is Michael Vorberger on the right. He's one of a long time uh, volunteer and mentor. Serving as a mentor is one of the best ways for skilled contributors to give back. The majority of our community members are volunteers who have had draining day jobs that prohibit them from contributing extensively. GSOC is a perfect way to engage these mentors and tap into their extremely valuable knowledge in a low-touch yet high-impact manner. They don't just contribute, they become the community. So they've, uh, it really, the project, this project wouldn't be around without them. All of the MIFO stack, all of our platform is managed by GSOC, uh, original GSOC members. And uh, GSOC, they, they, they go from uh, participant to mentor to ongoing volunteer. They are the most passionate evangelists for the project. It's a virtuous cycle. Uh, they keep coming back. So this nice quote uh, is from the first year participating in GSOC under Ed Cable, and it kind of nails why connecting, nails our, our connection of students and mentors across the globe. Just nod after you've read it or something, I'll keep going. Okay, cool. Uh, this will be online, by the way, so I'll make it available. Yeah, So please. GSOC is providing both GSOC provides the interns. Uh, the organizations provide the mentors. Okay. Yeah, you you need somebody with experience uh, that can guide them. Or particular project. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, GSOC, there there is a massive amount of support through Google. Google puts in all of the money, for example, for all the stipends, and they also uh, pay for the they they host the organization software to keep things moving through. They do they handle the reviews and all the infrastructure. So there's quite a bit taking place. It's all infrastructure and support. Are they doing much with, I noticed in the intern um, listing there, it was mostly male. Are they doing much with reaching out beyond the beyond that? That's a good question. I don't know if they have a, what they're doing with that. yeah, like a non-pale male quarter or something like that. I, I don't know. 
So now that you've seen how impactful GSOC can be, let's show you how you can put this in practice for your own program and yield the same impact for yourself. So the planning starts months in advance, basically right after the GSOC, the, the previous one concludes. And you need to engage your community, you need to seek out these mentors and see who in your project could be a mentor, um, start engaging them and, and get, them, uh, get them stoked to, to step up. So you need a list of ideas as well. So they need to be driven by user need. They need to matter. They need to be in the direction of the product roadmap and be achievable in a summer. Sometimes they're maintaining core and advancing our existing apps, and sometimes it's building whole new apps that connect. It's, that's one of the beauties of having a, a platform with the APIs is they can build something that works on these few APIs or these over here. Um, but uh, it's gonna be a lot harder when a pro with a project that's just a giant monolith, right? Once you've got a group of committed mentors and a list of solid fleshed out ideas and you've documented your process, you submit your app to be a mentor, mentoring organization. This is around January, February. So when your org is fortunate enough, uh, you'll get an email like this, it's been selected, then it truly begins. And students who are looking literally have hundreds of orgs to pick from. Uh, it's hard to stand out, but you can do it. And there are hundreds to pick from, but there are many more students that get accepted. So it's a, it's a pretty, it, the supply demand curve is, is nice in favor of the organizations participating. Uh, they do some, some organization, really what you have to do is, like if, if you're participating, you get in, you gotta have a landing page, you have to have some specific content because when they come looking, they gotta be able to find something. But you don't have to, I wouldn't say you don't have to budget advertising dollars or that kind of thing to, to excessively promote. They'll find you, just be there. Does that make sense? So blog posts, talk about your tech, you know, have, have good documentation. It's kind of like if you're following best practices for your, process, for your, for your project, if, you're, if your code is clean, if it's understandable, if there's a, a code map and there's contribution guidelines, if you have kind of this, this uh, infrastructure in place, all of that will be useful for GSOC, like it would for any other person starting. You kind of imagine, like, could somebody come along and join your project? You know, how would you onboard the next developer? Going through that process is the same thing of prepping for GSOC. So for evaluating the candidates, you need to look at their, uh, their other commitments. Are they motivated by our social mission? You know, you want to make sure they're in it for the right reasons. It's not much money, and so you don't have to worry too much about that, um, but that can differ you know, it's, it's different for everybody. And you do want to be very careful with your, uh, your interviews and, and uh, you know, get them on Skype, get some emotional bandwidth so you actually connect with the people. Um, definitely get into tech screening and making sure they got <laughs> the stuff you need. So have a, have a criteria, have a scorecard. Um, you have to fight to make it fair for uh, underrepresented minorities. And part of that is if you can exclude pictures from applications, and I think GSOC may do this automatically now, um, include pictures, even exclude names if possible. You can have IDs and just look at some skills and history. Um, but you know, necessarily you're gonna, you know, people can remain anonymous to some degree. They could have the, no video for Skype, um, but just know that you'll have to fight to keep it fair to underrepresented minorities. So do that. And and part of that is the the fair scorecard. Okay. Uh, amount of experience in these areas, uh, connection to this, uh, locked onto the mission, all of that. You, it's literally illegal to to screen based on based on um, unfair practices or you know. Seek out passion and potential. Just to just to put it in a nutshell, right? Students with strong backgrounds and resumes might be less likely, but. They're, if they're, the ones that are younger and earlier in their academic career, they have more to gain professionally and they're more likely to stick. And by the way, <coughs> all these are um, GSOC uh, members. So these are all students that participated. Engagement is critical. They should introduce themselves publicly, um, especially with open source is in the public often. And it's rarely in private. And so they have to be okay with they got to get a, P a PR in. I, that's our, you know, our criteria is you got you got to get a pull request in. You got to get some code moving and have material contribution. Not be afraid to do that. Not be afraid to be judged or it, not judged, but you know participate. Yeah, I, 
Yeah, and, and so, and it's not just them though, it's does your community welcome people starting and early on and, you know, are, are they fair to newcomers? Then that, that's, it, it works when you have that, all, that infrastructure again in place. Okay, so now you're in GSOC, you've, uh, you've got accepted, you got your people, and your, is everything clear up to that point, how you, you got your project in, you got your people and all that? Okay, just stop me if it's not. So Google has allocated, allocated your slots, you've selected your students, projects plan, project plans have been finalized, and community bonding period and coding is ready to begin. So first what you want to do early on is define success and make sure that they understand it as well. Apologize, that's a little bit off the screen. Uh, but you want them to be successful in completing the project. They want You want them to be challenged, learn and grow skill-wise and professionally. You want to feel like they've made an impact on your social mission and like they've like they're, they're part of the org and, and that there's a, there's a path to them becoming a long-time contributor. So this is a good little quote here from John O'Bacon. A sense of belonging is what keeps people in communities. The belonging is the goal of the community building. The hallmark of a strong community is when its members feel that they belong. And it's kind of, I don't know, it, it, it's a little, I was like, oh yeah, of course, that's obvious in hindsight, but um, you have to, you have to conscientiously and deliberately plan to make it this way. So, yeah, in, in a nutshell, belonging is our goal. In addition to belonging, we want to make it clear to an intern how they are immediately an integral part of the community and also show them the roadmap and blueprint for how they can grow in the community. So you can do this visually, you can groom them into a particular role, see what aligns with their passions, uh, and let them know about it, be in communication and contact. So you wanna have, uh, we even go to the, the, the lengths of a, like laying out a communications protocol. Okay, here's how often we're gonna talk, here are the methods, you know, online chats, uh, we expect uh, daily check-ins with the mentor and the student, we expect a weekly hangout, those kind of things. All these touch points are extremely important. It's not just for the exact work being done, but the social context, context around making decisions. Uh, every decision at the end of the day, uh, be it buying something or opening or closing a door, the last bit of that decision is emotional. And you need a connection with somebody to have the psychological safety and confidence to make that final emotional decision. And so that's why it's so important to have FaceTime as much as you can. I mean, a lot of these people are spread out all around the world, so you can't have FaceTime, and so use use technology to your advantage there. Yeah, I mean, internet is kind of a requirement as well. Yeah, go ahead. Do you know what you're using for status updates on that? Uh, let's see. They're using, this is Slack. Well, yeah, but yeah. the status update bot that they're posting with? Uh, Geekbot, I think is what it's called. Yeah. Uh, but hop in like Mifos on, um, so sorry, this, the Slack is the internal one, Gitter is the public chat. So you hop on there and ask questions, there's like a thousand people that have registered on there. And so if you want the exact chat button. Commit early and often, just best practices, not just for GSOC, all the time. Uh, it's easier to give feedback, you can help refactor, you can sense if the project is going the right direction or if it's off the rails. Uh, showcase their work. Uh, is a lot of times students need help with this. It's just like, oh, I just like, I don't know, I just, re you know, I made this database migration. And like, well, wait a second. I mean, that's not something any beginner can do. Like you, you spent a week learning how to do it. Let's just, you know, let folks know. Uh, there's many reasons it, it sh you know, it shows them their work is valued, um, but it lets folks know that didn't know there was database migration in there. All of those things matter. You wanna get feedback. Once people get into that fast feedback loop too, they start to believe in it and uh, lose some of the fear and all that, and that it takes, it takes deliberate work. So you wanna immerse them in the community, formal welcome, you wanna be transparent with them, encourage them, push conversations back to public forums. So a lot of times people are like, hey, can you just tell me where this thing is? Don't answer the question. Push it to a public forum and help them answer it in there. You can, you know, hey, I'm gonna tee this up for you. This is, where, this is how we do things. We ask questions in here. Because um, you're not the only one that asked that question. You're not the first one. And I can point you to a, a public link and then someone else will click on that link too. And so, but it, it's also daunting and it's, uh, you know, people don't, 
people aren't comfortable just automatically being in a public forum and asking what could be stupid questions. So help them out. So encourage uh, the individual students to blog. So once they get past that initial, now it's getting a little warmer, it feels better here now. Uh, once they get past that initial uh, just worry and fear and, you, and they start communicating, contributing, then you start, you feel that flow, then say like, hey, you know, it looks like you're, you're making progress. Why don't you do a blog post about it? You know, let folks know you did this hard thing and, and, uh, and then when they do that, uh, cross post and, you know, get it, get it on other places as well. Give him a shout out on social media, whatnot. Don't use Twitter. He's Mastodon. <laughs> Failure. Uh, yeah, so this is a, this is a tough one, uh, but important to remember up front, not everybody succeeds. And so uh, make sure that, that, that it's common knowledge that failure is an option. It's okay, uh, but we're going to learn from it, and we're not going to let somebody fail uh, on their own. We're going to take responsibility. We're going to come with you. And, uh, and Google needs to know, actually, as, as well. This is an important thing. Yeah. What that is or what you mean by it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it starts at the beginning of the project, really, when you define the success metrics. And if they're not hit, you know, it's like, oh, okay, we didn't see any commits in four weeks. I mean, we, you know, I don't know. We, we let it slide for a couple weeks. It's not working. You got to cut. There's, a, there's several check ins as well that are very structured. And Probably so you, well. yes, uh, yeah, as part of the program. And so you have to report, yeah, you know, really, in, you know, uh, you need to call it. Like, it's not, it's not happening. So uh, it comes with the success metrics and following the check-ins, and then it's, it's no surprise also to anyone, really. Okay, so after the program. So here's Ed and four interns at the Mentor Summit. And uh, these are, he, he's brought this uh, five R's philosophy here. Role, recognition, recommendations, referrals, and rewards. Know your role. So these folks are, uh, they, they've gotten uh, Apache Foundation Committer status. Zavik Anglais, Ishan Khanna, Gaurav Sini, Kurajanga, Rajan Mara, Nikhil Pawar. All former GSOC, all core repo maintainers and Apache committers. This is no small feat. Um, it's, it, there's, a, there's a high bar to entry there. And their um, springboard was Mifos as part of GSOC. So that in itself is a pretty solid material reward, probably more than you could, you could justify more than the financial rewards they're getting. Uh, it's, you know, for future jobs, whatever, but they'll generally, because of this, they'll, they'll remain part of it and, and pass on that, uh, that power to others as well. So more folks, uh, it's getting to be like too many to name at this point. <laughs> more mentors part of the Google code in so recognition uh, easy to easy to kind of bypass it, I guess it also feels like oh that's someone else's job yeah the social chair do the recognition no anyone can do this <laughs> it's not hard it matters it matters to you it matters to them so step in there don't just be a coder don't just be a QA don't just be a anything like be part of it, you know. Like you have to, you have to recognize that. You have to step up and, and recognize them as well. So it means, okay, fine. I don't usually do the blog post, but I'll I'll do the social post for this person, and you know, spread the love. Nobody, honestly, nobody loves just being that kind of person. So maybe some people do. Anybody love just doing that? Okay, nobody's raising their hands. There you go. Nobody loves just being. <laughs> Uh, you can do a wall of fame. Uh, I would advise against like rankings, like how many don't don't count commits, that kind of thing. That's BS. You can do monthly awards, star contributors. Uh, Google gives a stipend of five hundred dollars per student, and the organization can use that wherever they like. So that's back to the organization. <clears throat> we found the mo we found the most valuable way to use this is as a stipend to pay it forward and sponsor the travel of the interns attending or speaking at open source events. So uh, we've sent people to Convoke 2.0. It was a University of Delhi um, uh, travel to the GSOC Mentor Summit. Uh, some of the mentors are remote. Um, 
RBL Hackathon, Springer Conference, Google Developer Day, Fosh Asia. So I don't know, kind of a cool way to, to, to give back is, uh, I mean, Mifos uh, is, is good at raising money, uh, but it's always tight. Um, but th the students recognize that, hey, you know, we don't have a ton of money, but we paid it to, send, to bring you here. So it means a lot. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that don't count commits and don't run hate, but what kind of criteria do you guys use to uh, determine who you should be recognizing? Oh, recognize everyone. <laughs> yeah, is that fair? I don't mean to be glib. Uh, I think you ha if, if they're not doing recognition worthy contributions, they will probably fail GSOC. Um, they, just being a part of the program is what needs to be recognized. Like, hey, you're participating, you did the things you set out to do, that deserves recognition. I, what I meant was like, don't rank the recognition. You know what I mean? Yeah, I saw there was some like, uh, contributor of the month, so there is some. some we rotate activity. through contributor of the month. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it, I mean, that, that too, it can't be meaningless, right? So you can't just say, oh, everybody's gonna get contributor of the month once. No, you have to find something that's meaningful and matters and then highlight that. That's what it means. Not like you are the best of this month. More like, hey, we recognize this, con this valuable thing you did. Thank you. And we'd like to recognize you for that. So again, travel rewards. Um, <clears throat> yeah, quite a few. We've, we've done quite a few uh, travel rewards. Recommendations. So... This is where you can, you know, like explicitly recommend somebody because you've worked with them in a meaningful role. And, um, and your word as a mentor, as an organization chair, as an admin, whatever, means a lot to their future employers. And, and then just straight ahead referrals. So you'll likely know people that need people and now you'll know these people and so connecting them is extremely important networking is hard and it takes it needs again personal help and the connections and that's where your connections and the the FaceTime that you will have done through GSOC will help too you'll know these people and trust them okay and we kind of this is a bonus sixth R reunions uh, staying connected is extremely important for those this long-term contribution long-term involvement Always stay in touch, even if it's some low-touch communications. Uh, having that chat group open, uh, you can have an alumni mailing list. That, those kind of things really help people uh, stay in touch, uh, keep in touch with what's going on. You want to understand their academic pursuits. Uh, Reed Hoffman puts it, you want to make people a hero in their own story, right? You want to know what matters to them and how you're helping them realize that. So... If you keep in touch with them, you can say, you know, I saw this thing come up. Know that's your field. You're interested in that. Check it out. All that matters. Uh, here's a couple individuals we wanted to highlight. Gaurav, um, their specific history and, uh, and contributions. So, uh, yeah, all these folks have, have stuck around. Sometimes you'll see them at conferences. Am I missing anything? Do you want to throw anything at the end here? We have a little time. <laughs> Okay. I got t-shirts. T-shirts. <coughs> All right. Yes. So some things to make uh, to keep in mind uh, when you jump in this. Uh, it's not easy. Plan for the work. Uh, and kind of rule of thumb for me was when it's in the low numbers, like one person, two people. So if you're planning for one intern or two interns, I would I would say match up one internal person on the inside the org with each of those people not just as mentors but okay i'm going to make gsoc work for our org for one person and that takes me and then now i'm going to add one more person and now you're helping too and now even if we're not the mentors we're like point of contact responsibility uh we're last line of defense to make sure this goes through because there are i mean there's emails you got to close loops and just get it done and and uh but really, like, it's more important, say we're doing it, it's more important for us to, to get mentors signed up than to be mentors. Because that multiplicative effect, that network effect, is, is infinitely more valuable for the org at the end of the day. Yeah, don't be afraid to fail. 
Uh, also, that's part of just integrity. Like you have to follow through on what you said what was going to happen. Uh, and ship it. You know, uh, help them pull through. Get to the end. Uh, they need someone to help QA. Help them find somebody. You know. Yeah. In that shell. So, bit of a summary. I'll take questions anytime as well. Yeah, go ahead. So, you, I saw from one of your earlier slides, you have, it seems like a lot of people who are transitioning to mentors for future years. Yeah. Is there a process that you use to help those folks kind of make that transition? Uh, participant to mentor? So, there wasn't when I was doing it actively. I bet Ed has one now, I, and I don't know it offhand. That's a great question. I, I, I do recall that you'll know, like they'll be like, hey, can I be a mentor? And they're like, absolutely, because you can't wait. You can never have enough folks uh, standing in line to be mentors. So, and, and then you know them at that point too, and whether or not it'd be a good fit. So I recall that it was just kind of obvious. Like seeing how they reached out already during their time as an intern to help other people. It, like or just like or... if their internship went well and they communicated well, yeah. they'll generally be a great mentor too. But not everybody goes from, it's not like a manager. Right. So, cause there's no HR aspect. You're just kind of helping them along technically. And so otherwise, if it was more like an HR thing where they have reports and they have to do goals and all that junk, yeah. I mean, it's a lot simpler than that. So I think the process for vetting and transitioning from intern to mentor is simpler as well. And then is it one to one, like each intern has a mentor? Yes, I, it doesn't have to be. It's one assigned mentor. So I, as a mentor, could have two students, I think. Yeah. 